Whoever said that just needs to hush. All right. I said it just low enough. I'm not sure who said it. All right. So I didn't read our, our verse this morning, but our thought for the day is uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. Uh, it says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things into himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So we'll get to that in a minute here. That's our thought for today. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 18. Turn to, turn to Luke chapter 18, please. All right. So we are going to continue. And I think this is part 12, and this may be uh, the last part for a little bit. I'll probably uh, change subjects to uh, the Passover, back to the Passover for next week and, and the week after. But um, we've been studying the sermons of Jesus. We've been studying, uh, hopefully, what Jesus was trying to get across and the context of which he was using to do so. Um, he was preaching to large groups of people. He was preaching to diverse groups of people. You had Jews and Gentiles and all the people that he was trying to reach. And so you had him presenting truth in different ways at different times so that he could reach the people he was trying to reach. And so we saw in saw last week the parable in Matthew 18. And we looked a little bit about uh, the two debtors, the one that owed... 10,000 talents, and the one that owed 100 pence. And the takeaway for me in this parable is it shows us how, how pitifully helpless we are uh, and how great our front is to God. We cannot hope to pay the debt that was levied against us and, and how wicked we are that we don't even forgive others of little things and we, when we have been forgiven of so much so freely. So, continuing on with his parables, let's look in Luke chapter 18. We'll read another one here about two different people. In Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now, let's look a little bit at this parable, because this is also an important truth that we see. It's a, it's, a, it's a very important story that we're told. Okay? So, who is he speaking this parable to? It tells us in verse 9. This, this is directed to certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So two men went into the temple to pray. A Pharisee, Pharisees were the religious elite at the time. Pharisees kept all the rules. Pharisees said what they were supposed to say. They did what they were supposed to say, do. They kept all the laws. They were very, um, what's the word? They were very showy. They were very obvious about the way that they kept the law. Now, who's a publican? Now, was that? Well, Brother Mark is correct. Mom's also correct there, but was the Pharisee not also a sinner? Okay. So, so he was, well, the publicans were tax collectors. And, and, and while I'm not real fond of my taxes, I don't harbor any real ill will against my IRS agent, right? That's not how we, we feel in this day and age. Uh, while I, I have some very strong opinions about taxation and, and all this, I don't go out of my way to, you know, make IRS agents feel uncomfortable. But in this situation, a publican is a Roman tax collector. It, and, and since he is in the temple, he's probably not a Roman. He's probably a Jew that works for the Romans as a tax collector. 
Now, I've, I've seen a number of, uh, of non-biblical-based ideas about this, but we know that Matthew was a publican. We know that Matthew was a tax collector. We also know that Matthew was a Jew. So this story may have been about Matthew or it may not. But Jesus is telling a story here about a publican. Now, the way that the Jews felt about Jewish tax collectors would be about the way we feel about someone that came into your house and robbed you and the law protected him. If someone came into my house and took my money, let's let's say I've got a little bit of money in a cookie jar or something, that's, that's, that's my cash in the house. Let's say they come and take that and the law says, oh no, he can do that. Well, I wouldn't like that guy. Well, don't come to my house would be my answer, right? I don't want anything to do with you. That's how the the Jews felt about publicans. Publicans didn't get invited to dinner. Publicans didn't get sat with in public. Publicans were not popular, okay? Pharisees, Pharisees get invited to dinner. Pharisees get the high place at the table. Pharisees get the best cut cut of meat, right? Pharisees are the people that you want at your house because it makes you look better. So you have two people in society here, and he's giving the exact opposites. Someone who's very accepted, Everybody says, you're doing right. Somebody, everybody hates. Okay, so the Pharisee, he has an opinion of himself. He said, I'm not like this other guy. God, thank you that I'm, how spiritual. God, thank you that I'm not like this other guy. I do all the things I'm supposed to do. He lists them off here. And you got the publican over there. Who knows nobody likes him? He comes in there. What does he say? Well, Everybody else is just wrong. Well, what I do is legal. I'm not actually breaking any laws. I'm not really hurting anybody. Someone else would do the job if I didn't do it. Why is everybody so mad at me? No, he doesn't come in there and justify himself to God. He doesn't come in there and say, well, you know, Lord, I'm, I'm pay ties and I'm, I'm not that bad. It's just everybody else that's the problem. Which, in my opinion, everybody else probably could chill out a little bit, right? Why are they being mean to that guy? They don't like him. Take, takes their money. Does he come and justify himself to God? He says, No. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He smote his breast. I don't often smite my breast when I pray. I'm not, that, I'm not that dramatic about it. Most people aren't. I don't see anybody hitting themselves. But there are some times I've been really upset in my life, some really, really bad days where I'm kind of, I'm kind of overdramatic, and I won't, I won't act that out for you now. But I, I, I'll... I'll hit things or, or be angry. Put a, put a couple holes in my door at, at once because I was having a bad day. That's the kind of emotion he's going through. He's having a bad day. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And we see in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So what's the difference before God between the two? You've got one that's doing what, you know, he thinks God wants him to do. You've got another one that knows he's not doing what God wants him to do. What was was the difference between the two of them? You're both correct. It's pride. Who was humble before God? See, his mom said earlier, uh, that the publican was a sinner, and we, we determined that both are sinners. But Jesus, and this is, this is not somebody's opinion, this is Jesus telling us through his word which attitude was correct. See, and he's telling the people who have the attitude of the Pharisee that they're okay, and these other people, they're less than me because they don't do what's right. See, folks, we, we see this All the time. We see people's attitudes. We see people that think, well, you know, I'm okay. I don't I don't need to do anything. I'm 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 okay. And then you have other people go, I'm not okay. I run into people that are at times broken and upset and and things are going their way. And you ask them, Are you okay? No, I'm not okay. Everything's gone wrong. I'm 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 I need I need help. Most of the time they're thinking about earthly things, but this this publican, he knows he needs help. The Pharisee is up there telling God, I don't need help. It's two attitudes. Okay? So let's turn to 
Let's turn. Let's back up just a little bit and go to Luke chapter 15. We're going to look at two attitudes. See the the parable in Matthew 18 about the two debtors, the publican and the Pharisee, and we're going to look at this parable of the prodigal son. They all have this in common. There are two distinct attitudes found in each of these parables. Let's look at verse 11. Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Well, that's a very short piece of the story. But for some context, that was as rude as going up to his father and saying, hey, drop dead, I want your money. Drop dead now, I want your money. That was, that was just not done in their culture. That was absolutely unacceptable. His father would have been well within his rights to disinherit him, to tell him, you're not my son, go away. I don't want anything to do with you. You can't treat me like that. But we see he simply divides into him his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. See, he knew what he, knew what he deserved. He knew what he deserved. So he, he's like, okay, well, that, that is who I am. It's, that's who he was before he left, by the way. Not worthy. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran. That phrase, and ran, and ran, is very important because it was also against the culture of that day for old men to run. It was undignified. It was not something a man of stature or age would do ever, except in an emergency. But he ran. It was an emergency. He had to go let his son know that he loved him. And fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Got a nice little speech prepared. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. There's so much symbolism in this. There's so much to be gleaned from this part of the story. Where the father doesn't care about his little speech. His little well prepared response. Of like, I, I, I see now how bad I am dad. I, I know I'm not what I should be. I know I'm not worthy. But the fact that he came to the Father was all the Father cared about. Don't care what you've done. Don't care where you've been. Don't care what you got to say. You came to the Father. I'm going to take care of you because you're my son and there's nothing that you can say can change that. Wow, what a, what a, what a, what a way of showing us how God feels about us. We, we, as humans, are as bad as this rude little boy that goes up to his dad and says, drop dead, dad, I just want your money. And he says, okay, you can have your way. And then life kicks him a little bit. He gets where he's in want. That's what the Bible says, he, he was, became to be in want. He realized, oh, I'm I'm stupid. 
what I, what I need, my father has. Well, I've done wrong. I can't go back to my father and say, well, Dad, give me what I need. Well, I think he'll give me what I need even if I'm not worthy. And I'll tell him, you know, I'm not worthy, but I think he'll, he'll at least feed me. He'll take care of my basic needs if I'll just go back to him. So he goes to the father. And the father doesn't care at all what he's got to say. Doesn't care at all what kind of condition he comes in. He's been feeding pigs. You think he smelled good? Walked from the far country? Didn't even have shoes on his feet by the time he got there. Do you think he was in, in the state to receive people? No. The father runs to him because it's an emergency. And celebrates his return and gives him all the things he's not worthy of. Now in verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to the house. He heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry when not go in. Therefore came his father out and treated him. Now let's look at this from the brother's perspective for a moment. The elder brother, where was he when all this happened? He was there the whole time. He was even in the field when his brother came back, working. He thinks his brother's little, a little, little snot, right? Shouldn't have done that to dad. Dad shouldn't have given him any money. How dare he? But now he's back and we're celebrating it? So he's, so now, he's, now he's puffed up. He's done everything he was supposed to do. He's done it right, but it now it seems like the father loves the, the bad boy more than the good boy. How dare he? That's not fair. So he's outside sulking. But look in verse 28. He would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. See, he didn't, he didn't go to a far country and come back, but he wouldn't go in to the father. His father came to him too. So he got the same treatment. Father cared for him as well. And he answering, verse 29, said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make marry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son has come, which hath, you notice he doesn't say my brother, he says thy son has come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. See, he thought his father's love had something to do with how hard he worked for his dad. He thought his father's love depended on him doing the right things. Look at verse 31. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry, and be glad, for this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. See, at first glance, this story doesn't seem very fair to the older brother. And as a person that's gone to church their whole life, has stayed out of trouble for the most part, the Lord's kept me out of trouble more than anything. And you see people that the Lord blesses, and you're like, oh, man, am I not doing a good enough job? I feel like the older brother sometimes, where it's like, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Why does he get what I want? See, it's an attitude of not not realizing it has nothing to do with what we're doing. It has nothing to do with, with the way that we uh, try to follow God's will. We are loved regardless. See, even though it doesn't seem fair that his brother did whatever he wanted and still got to enjoy the benefit of his father's house, this example is in the Bible for a reason. It's to teach us about our attitude and to realize that God loves all of his children. God's love and acceptance has nothing to do with our behavior and has no limit. See, the, the younger brother treated his father as poorly as he could. He ignored what he wanted, took his money, told him to drop dead, went out. He had no merit on which to stand with the father other than he was his son. The other brother had everything to count on. He was 
faithful and stayed and he worked and, and did what his father said. The story is to teach us God doesn't care whether or not you've been good. doesn't care where you've been. He cares where you're going. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to know that he loves you. The Father's love is unconditional. And the attitude, see, if, if the younger son hadn't had the attitude of, I need to go back and I need to, to admit who I am in this story, which is, I'm not worthy. See, he could have stayed where he was, maybe starved to death, maybe found a job. But he knew that he could get what he needed going to the Father. Probably would have died if he didn't. The attitude in, of the two debtors in Matthew chapter 18, where there was one that owed a lot and one that owed a little. But both were forgiven. All right. Just like the Pharisee, Simon, and the, and the woman, that, uh, woman that washed Jesus' feet, Jesus said, who do you think loves me more? The one that knows they've been forgiven of a lot or the one that thinks that they didn't have to be forgiven of very much? Well, folks, if you realize who you are, like this, this young man that came to himself and realized who he was, you'll realize that you are in need of something you cannot provide. But the Father's love offers it to you always. Whether you're out here in a far country doing stupid stuff or you're still on the farm with Dad. Now, the one that's still on the farm with Dad didn't realize what he had. Because the Father says, all that I have is thine. Folks, whether it's yourselves or your family or people, there, everyone's in one or two camps. I can be good enough of myself, I don't need God, or I have no hope of myself, and I need God. And only those that realize that they need God and can't help themselves will ever see that salvation is taken care of, and they can go to heaven because of what the Father has done, what Christ has done. I think that's enough for today. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for this church. We thank you for everybody that came today. Lord, we ask you to bless these people, bless their families, bless their health, bless their livelihoods, bless everybody they come in contact with, Lord. Be with us as we go out through the week and bring us back next Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen.